All right, so 1.5 is just more on slope. Really what we're talking about is some applications of slope. We want to be able to slow, uh, find slopes and equations of lines of uh, parallel and perpendicular lines. We want to interpret slope as a rate of change, and we want to find a function's average rate of change. Okay. All right. First thing, parallel lines. If two lines, uh, non-vertical lines, we should say, are parallel, then they have the same slope. Okay? So you've got two parallel lines. As long as they're not vertical, that guarantees, since they're parallel, that they have the same slope. Flip that around and say, if two lines have the same slope, they're parallel. So this is an if and only if then, I don't know what it's called. It goes both ways. So if they're parallel, they have the same slope. If they have the same slope, they're parallel. Now, what if you don't have a slope? Well, two distinct vertical lines are also uh, parallel. So if they're both vertical, neither one of them have a slope, right, because slope is undefined for a vertical line. Uh, but two vertical lines are parallel. Now, what if we want to write an equation of a line passing through a point it's parallel to another line. So if I say I need an equation that's parallel to 3x plus 1, what's the slope going to have to be for the line that I'm creating? Be careful, not 3x, just 3. The x is not part of the slope, it's just the, the variable. But it is 3, right? m is 3. So I know I'm going to have a slope of 3, and it's going to pass through the point negative 2, 5. So can I find an equation if I've got a point and a slope? Yeah, I got point slope form, right? That's one of the things we do. So if it's parallel to 3x plus 1, then it has a slope of 3. Where's my? Oh, there it is. Oh, what happened? How did that happen? All right, 3x plus 1, slope of 3. So we're going to use point slope form, y2 minus y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. Right, that's point slope form. So if I do that, I get y minus 5 equals 3 times x minus negative 2. Right, because x1, y1 are negative 2 and 5. So the minus minus becomes positive and you just rewrite it as y minus 5 equals 3 times x plus 2. That's point slope form. It asks for point slope form, so we're done. We don't have to take it any further. Now, what if it said put it in slope intercept form? What would I do? Distribute the 3. Add 5 to both sides. Get y by itself, right? We want y equals mx plus b. So that's really all we would do. All right. So that's parallel lines. Perpendicular lines, if two lines are non-vertical and they're perpendicular, what does perpendicular mean? Yeah, are they intersect at a right angle. So if they are perpendicular, then the product of their slopes is going to be negative 1. Okay? If the product of two lines slopes is negative 1, then those lines are perpendicular. It goes the other way. The other one is if a line is horizontal, it will automatically be perpendicular to a vertical line. So remember, vertical has no slope, so we can't use condition 1 and 2 for those. So we have to add a third condition. Now, another way of saying this, and an easier way of remembering this, is that perpendicular lines have negative reciprocal slopes. Okay, so if one is positive, the other has to be negative. If one's negative, the other has to be positive. And they're always going to be reciprocal of each other. Okay, so if I say, are these two things perpendicular? M equals 2, M equals 1 half. Why not? They're both positive, right? They have to be opposite of each other. So one has to be positive, one has to be negative. What if I say that that's negative 2? Now they are because they're opposite each other and they are reciprocal of each other, right? What about C 
7 fifths and negative 5 sevenths. Yeah, they're negative of each other. One's positive, one's negative, and they are reciprocal of each other. Okay? Now, what happens if I multiply positive 2 times negative, or negative 2 times positive 1 half? What do I get? Negative 1, right? The 2 and the 1 half cancel out, and you just got a negative times a positive. What happens if I multiply 7 fifths times negative 5 sevenths? The sevens cancel out, the fives cancel out. You just have a positive one times negative one, negative one. That's why the product will always be negative one, because the negative reciprocals cancel out. Okay? So we want to find the slope of any line perpendicular to the line whose equation is x plus 3y minus 12 equals zero. This is in general form, right? How am I going to figure out what the slope of that line is if it's in general form? Right, I'm going to, need to put it over into slope intercept form by solving for y. So if I want to solve for y, I'm going to start by adding 12 to both sides, subtracting x from both sides. And that'll give me 3y equals negative x plus 12. But I don't want 3y, right? I want y, so I'm going to divide by 3 and get negative 1 third x plus 4. So the slope of this line is negative 1 third. So what's the slope of any perpendicular line? Three over one. Positive 3 over 1. Right. Okay. It's pretty straightforward. It's just remembering which one's which. All right. Any questions on parallel and perpendicular? The key here is also remembering how to find, uh, not so much in this one, but like we did in the parallel one, being able to use point-slope form to derive an equation. Okay. Because that will be on the homework. All right, so slope, we define that as the ratio of the change in y to the change in x, right? y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Uh, basically, it's describing how fast y is changing with respect to x. Now, we deal with rate of change every day. Can anybody tell me the premier example of a rate of change that we deal with every day? Yeah, speed, miles per hour, feet per second, you know, meters per microsecond, I don't know, whatever. But speed is a rate of change because it's something changing per something else, miles per hour. Okay, so we can set that up as a ratio. Uh, it's always the dependent variable, uh, your independent variable, okay the dependent variable changing with respect to the independent variable. So when we talk about slope, it's always y changing with respect to x because x is the independent variable and y is the dependent variable. If we were talking about miles per hour, that would be position changing over time. So position would be your independent or your dependent variable and time is your independent variable. Remember, the variable that you change, that's the one that's independent. So when I talk about per hour, so how far did I go in seven hours? That's what makes it the independent variable, okay? All right, so we're gonna look at this problem. In 1990, there were nine million adult men in the United States living alone. So sad. In 2008, 14.7 million men lived alone. And that's even sadder. Can we use this information to create uh, an equation and find the slope of the linear function that represents this? And if we can, let's do it. Okay, we can, so let's do it. Now, if I'm talking about a change, what's changing here? The number of men that are living alone, right? So that's what's changing. Over what? over time. So here, once again, we'll say time is going to be the independent variable because I'm going to say, well, how many, how many lonely men were there in 2027? You know, I can change my time. So time is going to be the independent variable. Therefore, the number of lonely men is going to be the dependent variable. So that tells us we're changing these two things. Well, if I can think of these as being two variables, can I not just set up ordered pairs? Right? 
we always represent our ordered pair as x, y, which is independent and dependent, right? So which one is the independent? It was the time, right? So I can think of 1990 and 9 million as being 1990, 9, 9 million as an ordered pair. And then 2008 and 14.7 would be our second ordered pair. So we know the slope is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, right? The ch change in y divided by the change in x. So we'll get 14.7 million minus 9 million over 2008 minus 1990. So 5.7 million divided by 18, and these are years, right? So what do you get if you divide 5.7 by 18? Five point seven divided by eighteen. Am I the only one with a calculator? And it says to do it to two decimal places, so point three two million per year. So that's three hundred and twenty thousand lonely men per year. I don't know why men are getting so lonely. Well, I say that. I've got to be careful. It says they're living alone. It doesn't say they're lonely. They may have cats or dogs. I would be an angry man if I had to live with cats. But All right. So does everybody see what we did? We just changed this into an ordered pair so that we could find the slope. Y2 minus Y1, X2 minus X1. It's always going to be that, that uh, dependent, change in dependent over change in independent. Okay? So this is what it looks like, the average rate of change. Let me give you an example. Say I am driving and I pass mile marker 100 at noon. Keep on driving. I pass mile marker 200 at 1 o'clock. Okay? What was my average speed? Right? I went 100 miles. I went one hour. That's an average of 100 miles an hour. Now, does that mean I went 100 miles an hour the whole time? No, it just means the average was 100. I might have gone 120 during part of it and got pulled over by a cop during part of it. You know, So it's just going to average out to 100. So that's what's important is it's the average. And that's going to be a slope. So if you look at this function here in blue, if I started here and went here, then the line that connects them is going to represent that average. The slope of that is going to be the average. Okay. So we're just always looking for slope. Anytime you see from here until you graduate from the last math you'll ever take, rate of change just means slope. Okay. So if I want to find the average rate of change of a function from one point to another, then all I'm looking at is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, right? It's just the slope. Well, how do I find y2 and y1? How do I find the y value associated with those specific x's? Is that not just f of x2 minus f of x1? Just plug those values in to my function? Absolutely. And as a matter of fact, that was the formula that we had, right, for the change. So we're just going to say that's just f of 0 minus f of negative 2 over 0 minus negative 2. Right? I'm just putting in x2 equals 0 and x1 equals negative 2. So what do I get if I plug in 0 to our function? Right, I get 0 cubed, which is just 0. What if I plug in negative 2? What's negative 2 cubed? Negative 8. So it's 0 minus negative 8. On the bottom, I've got 0 minus negative 2, so I've just got 2. Negative negative 8 is 8 over 2 
is 4. So our average rate of change is 4. I don't have any units, so I can't say 4 somethings per something, but it's just 4. Does that make sense? Take your x value, plug your x value into your function. Those are going to give you the y values at those places. Okay? Okay? What if I asked you for the average rate of change of f of x3 over the interval from negative 2 to 0? What would that be? Anybody want to hazard a guess? Anybody want to hazard a guess? It's 4. That's the problem. right? If we said x1 is from negative 2 and x2 is 0, that means I went from negative 2 to 0. That's all this says. So if you ever see the problem written out as on an interval, that just means that the first number is x1, the second number is x2. Okay? So I didn't really change anything by writing it that way, just the way it's written. All right, any questions on that? Now, when we talk about the average velocity, velocity is a rate of change. Therefore, we haven't really, we're doing the exact same thing. We're just saying velocity instead of rate of change. But we said velocity is a rate of change. For some reason in, in mathematics, physics, uh, any physical science, when we talk about position, we always use the, the letter S. So the function S is always going to be a position function. It's always going to vary with respect to T. T is time. So we're changing our position as time changes, right? That's what S of T is. So delta S over delta T is what we're using instead of delta Y over delta X. Otherwise, it's exactly the same. T becomes X. S becomes Y. We're just going to plug in our X values to get out uh, Y values. So assume we have a ball that we're rolling down a ramp. The equation of motion for this, uh, the position is going to be given by 4t squared. Right? t is in seconds, s is in feet. So we want to find the average velocity from time t equals 1 to time t equals 2. So you've got a one second span there, and I want to know during that one second, what was its average velocity? Well, I know that average velocity is delta s over delta t. Did we talk about delta and what if anytime you see delta it just means change, change in s over change in t. So, how do I find delta s? Well, that's just s2 minus s1 t2 minus t1. Well, s2 is just s at x2. Now these steps are not, you know, you don't have to write these steps every time you do one of these problems. Once you recognize what you're doing, you'll skip right from this to actually plugging the values in. So we're going to take T2, which is, T1 is 1, T2 is 2. So this is going to be S of T2, so 4 times 2 squared minus 4 times 1 squared over 2 minus 1. So everybody see that S of T2, we're just plugging in 2 to our function. So 4 times 2 squared. For S of T1, we're just plugging in 1 for our function. So 4 times 1 squared. Everybody see that? Yes. OK. T2 minus T1 is just 2 minus 1. So this is going to give us 4 times 4 is 16 minus 4 over 1 which is just 12. What would the unit be for this velocity? <coughs> Feet per second, right? Because it's always the unit of distance divided by the unit of time. So this is feet per second. Okay? 
So from one second to two second, its average velocity was 12 feet per second. Now that's all well and good. What if I change that though? What if I ask you to find the average velocity from one second to one and a half seconds? The only thing changing here is the value of T2, right? So that's also going to change S of T2. So we're looking at delta S over delta T. So we're going to plug in T2, so 4 times 1.5 squared minus 4 times 1 squared over 1.5 minus 1. Well, 1.5 squared is 2.25. 4 times 2.25 is 9. So we get 9 minus 4 over 1.5 minus 1, which is just 0.5. So 5 divided by 0.5, which is 10 feet per second. All right, from 1 to 2, the average speed was 12. From 1 to 1 and a half, the average speed is 10. Does this make sense in a physical world that it's going slower up here than it is down here? It kind of does, because if you think about things, if you drop something, what force is acting on things when we drop them? Gravity, which is an acceleration, which means the further it goes, the faster it goes. So if we're rolling down a hill, the first half a second average should be smaller than the full second that includes the next piece. Now what if I asked you from one second to one and a quarter seconds? Do you think it would be more or less than 10? Yeah, it should be less, right? Because we're only talking about a smaller portion at the beginning. So it should be going slower, speeding up as it goes. Okay? So think about these things when you do these kind of problems. Ask yourself physically, does this make sense, this answer that I'm getting? And this one, it kind of does. It doesn't guarantee you've got the right answer, but it does guarantee you that you haven't gone off the reservation. Okay? All right, any questions on that? All right, that's all we're going to cover. So we're going to look at a worksheet that you are going to be angry at me about. <laughs>